Thanks a lot for inviting me. Um, I guess this is probably the first AutoML conference that I've, uh, well, that's not necessarily true, but I guess industry AutoML conference that I've been to. I think it's nice to have a whole um, conference dedicated to this, these, uh, these topics, because I think it's becoming quite popular over the past at least like two years or so. So um, I'm gonna talk about uh, a number of things, but primarily my talk is focused on the H2O AutoML algorithm and sort of the H2O platform itself. So just a little bit about uh, H2O, I'm not sure you know, who is in the audience and, and what kind of background they have about machine learning platforms in general, but, um, but basically H2O is, uh, it's a company. So H2O.ai is, is a company that I work at. Um, I've been there for about five years. And um, it's also H2O is the name of the, the platform. Um, we, we now have multiple, you know, platforms and tools and some of them are open source and some of them are not but the primary one that and the reason the reason the company was started is is the platform called h2o which is open source and we have um, a library libraries in r python um, everything's written in java but for data scientists mostly we're, we're talking about r and python users so that's that's where we focus our um, efforts is to, to make nice polished apis for that and kind of, I'll, I'll get into more detail, but just very quickly, it's, it's sort of a, a distributed machine learning platform for, you know, big data. And if you can remember, if you were around in the in industry in 2012, big data was like what everybody was talking about. Now everybody's talking about AI, maybe now AutoML. Um, so that was kind of the motivation was, could we build a library that's, that's really scalable to big data for enterprise use cases? Um, and make it open source. Um, so this is the agenda. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the platform in case you've not uh, heard of it before or used it before. And then I'll do a little sort of overview of AutoML. I know there's there's probably a lot of people on this call that um, have, a, have a pretty extensive background in AutoML, but there also might be people that are new. So I just want to say a few things. Um, and then I'll go into some details about what is H2O AutoML, how do you use it, and you know what are what are some of the ways in which it's set apart from other tools, and and then I'll send you home with some some links where you can <clears throat> do some tutorials and start using it yourself. And um, typically I'll always put my slides up uh, on the internet afterwards. If you go to that link, you'll you'll find you'll find them eventually, they'll be in a folder there for all the talks that, that we give at H2O. Um, okay, so the platform itself, and so I, I use the word platform instead of library because that's really more descriptive of what it is. So it's essentially, you know, it's machine learning algorithms, but it's also a whole like sort of data processing distributed data, you know, platform <laughs> essentially. It's sort of almost like a whole Spark, but before Spark existed. So we had to <clears throat> we had to build all of that infrastructure of like distributed data frames and all of that from scratch uh, because it actually started before Spark. And it was originally geared towards working with data that was stored in Hadoop. Um, but that said, uh, most people just use it as like a normal library for in Python or R on their laptop. Um, if you're using it on a server, like most people are using it on a single machine. Um, however, it, it's really designed to be um, used in a distributed setting and it, it can scale, you know, as, as much as you need it to essentially. And, and sort of the, the hardware that it was sort of designed for is something like Amazon EC2, where it's like cheap, cheap, uh, you know, distributed clusters where you're not having to buy, if you think back to 2012, like what a one terabyte RAM machine would cost. Now it's not so hard to, to get access to that kind of hardware, but back when we designed this, this platform, that was, that was something that we saw as like a huge benefit was building a distributed platform where you could really scale to big data on cheap commodity hardware like Amazon EC2. So, um, that's sort of the you know, motivation behind the library. So 
when I try to describe it to people that have not heard it before, I say it's kind of like a scikit learn. So then people are like, well, why would you reinvent scikit learn? <laughs> it's you know, very fully featured, widely used. Well, this is kind of why we wanted something that could scale to like very large data sets. And everything's written in Java from scratch. Um, and then we make APIs available in R and Python, like I said before. And then one of the other features that, that we um, have is you can deploy models pretty easily to production as pure Java code. And that's another sort of design um, element from the very beginning is like we wanted something where, um, you know, you could have a data scientist working in R or Python produce the actual code that goes to production and not have this whole process of prototyping in R and Python and then like having to rewrite everything in C++ or Java or something like that. In the last eight years, a lot of the tooling has gotten a lot better where we see a lot more stuff going into production from, you know, just native Python and stuff like that. But um, it used to be a lot more difficult. And so this, this was sort of to, to, to bridge that gap. So that's kind of um, all I'll say about that. Um, just a, a few terms um, that we have in H2O. We have, so we have some just terminology that's useful to know about. So we have something that's called the H2O cluster. And that's just our name for the shared Java process where everything is happening. So that's where all the, the models are trained. That's where all your data is living in memory. Um, that's just what we call that process. So when the first thing that you do when you use H2O is you start up an H2O cluster, either on like a single node or across um, an actual physical cluster. And then, um, then we have something called a, an H2O frame, which is basically a distributed data frame. And when you're working with it in R and Python, it really is sort of seamless. You don't feel like you're working with some, you know, object that's, uh, you know, difficult to work with. We, we make it so that the same syntax can be used for like a Python pandas data frame as an H2O frame in Python or like an R data frame in R. Um, it's not fully supporting every single thing that you could do with a pandas data frame, but for the most part, we have a lot of the, the data, you know, the operations that you would normally do um, in pandas um, supported in, in, in the H2O frame, and you don't have to learn a new way of interacting with the data frame itself. So that was important to us to not have to sort of burden the user by learning a whole new way of subsetting rows or merging, you know, frames, etc. So those are just some terms, just to put you on the same page here. And then this is a very high level overview from like a machine learning perspective, like what's included. Um, I, I mentioned before, it's, it is very similar to scikit-learn in the sense that we have a whole bunch of algorithms, supervised and su unsupervised, um, that are included. Um, we do have maybe a little bit smaller uh, list of, of algorithms because they all have to be sort of able to be distributed to large data. Um, so we have to actually be able to write the algorithm in a distributed fashion, and that's sometimes difficult, um, especially for um, like algorithm, algorithms like GVM, like that was quite hard to get that to, to work in a distributed set, setting, but we came up with some ways to do that. And um, we have everything kind of that goes along with a machine learning library like um, cross-validation, grid search, random search. We do a lot of stuff um, automatically that you might typically have to write code for uh, with scikit-learn. So like, you don't have to impute your data or normalize your data or encode your data. Uh, we will handle that all natively. Um, so that's one of the, the nice things I like about it. You don't have to write a lot of pre-processing code. Um, we have some features built in which help to do early um, early stopping so that you don't overfit. This is particularly important on like GVMs or deep neural networks. Um, and then once you have the models trained, we have every model has variable importance. We, they, they all have the same uh, metrics available, um, plots, et cetera. So it's, it's really a unified interface to just a whole bunch of algorithms. And um, we, uh, yeah, so that, that's all I'll say. If you've used scikit-learn, you'll, you know, you'll feel pretty comfortable using this. And if you're an R person, it's maybe more similar to like the carrot package or the new tidy models package. <clears throat> okay, so 
let's talk about AutoML. So, um, you know, this it's rare that I'm in an audience where like a lot of people probably already know about AutoML, but <clears throat> I just want to point out just to get everybody on the same page, just some of like at least my definition. It's it's really hard to define what AutoML is, so I like to talk about like what are some of the goals of AutoML or some of the features of AutoML, and I think. Um, one of the main things that sticks out to me is like the, one of the goals is to, to train the best model that you can with the least amount of time. And um, <clears throat> by that, you can talk about time in terms of computation time. So just, you know, flat out cost of training that model, like how, how much does it actually cost in terms of CPU time and, and that actually translates into money. Um, and then also in terms of the, the user time. So how much time does the user have to take to set this up and get it going? And um, we're tr really trying to reduce both of those uh, pieces as much as possible. Um, so, but most AutoML systems at this point, uh, one of the ways that they work is they train a bunch of models and then they, you know, find a good one. And so I think probably in the future we might see more of like more what, what, what would be called meta learning or sort of trying to predict what the best hyperparameters are in advance so that you don't waste the time um, to actually compute those models. But I think most tools today are not at that point yet. There's a couple different uh, tools that do something like that. But to actually get really good performance, you do end up having to really compute a lot of things. And so that's what it looks like today in the future that might evolve and we might be able to sort of minimize more on the computation side. Um, so another sort of feature, I guess, is like it really makes it quite easy to do, um, to do auto ML um, or to do machine learning when you, when you sort of strip everything down to the bare bones of like what, what is a supervised machine learning algorithm. It's basically training data. It's, identifying what what is the response variable the outcome variable or the thing you're trying to predict it's saying how long do you want this to run for and then maybe you know you could say i'm i'm in particular for my binary classification problem i'm interested in maximizing auc or minimizing log loss so some um most cases the, the user would have an idea of like what is the metric that they're trying to measure their system on and then you can tell the AutoML system, which one do you care about? Um, and one thing I'd love to see more, more widely is, is uh, using AutoML tools in, in research, like scientific research. I think they're a great way to set baselines for things without very much effort at all. Um, you know, the, the thing that I hate to see sometimes is in scientific research when you have like a very interesting new application of machine learning to some some scientific problem and, and maybe in the paper all they do is like they train a default random forest and then that's it. So that's interesting, but it's, you know, we really want to know like what's the real, uh, how, how good could machine learning be in this new discipline? And, and so we, we don't really get to know that if, if the user is just, you know, trying one model or something. So we want to really set a good baseline. And then of course, then just like, you know, in scientific research or in industry, you could use AutoML as a starting point and then try to improve from there. Um, so I've always had this slide in my um, talks about AutoML, but I recently started to put this slide in. Slide in. Um, I gave a talk um, recently at the, the Use R conference. So I'm like a big R person. I like Python too, but I'm, I'm a statistician by training, so I'm, I'm more of an R person. And, um, I was one of the keynote speakers at the Use R conference this year, and I gave a talk about, um, was, it was called Responsible Automation. Like, how can we, um, we're building all these tools that make it super easy to do machine learning, um, but we often don't talk about, like, maybe some of the negative side effects that, that we can have with AutoML. And I'm not trying to say this to make anybody feel sad, um, but what I'm doing is I would like to motivate people to, to try to build more um, let's say guardrails into these systems. And I'll talk a little bit more about this at, at the end. Um, but I would love to see, I think there right now is, is kind of a focus on sort of the Kaggle type of AutoML system. It's just like get the best performance at all costs. 
Um, we're starting to see people talk a little bit more about interpretability and, you know, maybe this model is good, but it's not very interpretable and how could we use it. We're also starting to see a lot of conversations around like algorithmic fairness is like, maybe this model is very good, but it's very unfair on these particular demographics of people that it's being deployed on. So like, I would love to see more conversations about like, as we're accelerating people into doing more machine learning and making it so easy, and um, you know, what are some of the other things that we need to think about as we build these tools? Um, so that's kind of like a, you know, a call out to all tool makers and users of AutoML. Um, let's start thinking about what, what things that we can build in the tools that make make more interpretable AutoML, make more um, fair AutoML. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail about that. And if you want to listen to a whole talk about that, you can Google my use our talk, but um, I'm just going to throw that out there. So yeah, so AutoML is really just about automating the different pieces of machine learning. So not everyone might agree that ensembles are a key part of um, AutoML, for me, it is because I know ensembles to be the way to kind of get the best performance that you can get when you're combining multiple models together. Um, but uh, so that's sort of, this is my own personal opinion of the different pieces. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more about what I mean by this stuff. So data pre-processing. So uh, different AutoML systems address each of these topics to varying degrees. So there aren't a lot of AutoML tools that handle the sort of automated data pre-processing stuff as much. I think most of them are focused more on um, model tuning, um, but we're, in order to really fully address, um, you know, automation of data science or machine learning, it would be great to have more of the data side um, process. So, we could you know, do automatic feature selection, feature extraction, automate, automated ways of like smartly encoding categorical features, um, you know, trying out different encodings and seeing what's gonna work, that type of thing. Um, in terms of model generation, like the, some of the two main things that we see is you know, one, we can do big grid searches or random searches and then on the other end of things, we have things like Bayesian hyperparameter optimization. Um, then we have some more newer things like, like there's um, hyperband, there's BOHB, which is Bayesian optimization and hyperband sort of merged into one algorithm. So there's all sorts of different ways that, that uh, you know, different techniques that people use to um, generate or tune models. Um, so I'm just sort of throwing that out there. So these are all things that need to be automated as well. And then if you're sort of in the camp that I am, which is um, generally I like to do a lot of stacking and stuff like that, uh, you know, you could do ensembles or not. For, for each use case, it's you have to consider whether or not you want to do that. But um, if you're kind of looking for just getting the best model, uh, there, that's one way to do it. And I just want to point you to a blog post in case uh, you're new to AutoML. Like, there's a lot of confusion about AutoML, especially since a lot of the um, bigger cloud companies like Google, Google got into AutoML like about a year and a half ago. Now Amazon is into AutoML. Like, a lot of the companies are putting stuff out there. And so now we're seeing like a lot of marketing around AutoML. So sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to understand what's what and what tools are good for what types of data and things like that. So if you're confused or want to read more about it or give an article to a friend who is new to AutoML, I would recommend this blog post. Um, all right, I want to make sure I leave enough time for questions. So I'm going to kind of just briefly go over what we have in the H2O AutoML. So this is just a function inside of H2O. So H2O is just a package. Can pip install H2O or install NR uh, from CRAN. Um, this is sort of that last slide, but with some things highlighted that we have in, in H2O AutoML. So we have a lot of the sort of basic data pre-processing stuff automated um, in the next release of H2O 332, which should be out like at the end of September or early October. 
we will have automated target encoding of high cardinality categorical features, which has been something we've been working on for a long time. Um, that's, you know, when we have an auto ML system, it does really need to handle all these edge cases where let's say you put in, there's a column with zip code in your data and all of a sudden you've got, you know, 40,000 levels and you're, you know, we need something that's not just gonna blow things up. So we, we need to um, look for these sort of, uh, you know, difficult use cases with data and, and handle them properly. So that's one thing that we'll have. And our basic approach, um, I'll go over in a little bit more detail let's say on the next slide. So, so the approach that we have currently, and this is, you know, sort of evolving over time. Um, this is, we've had this software out for about three years now. Um, and fundamentally, the algorithm has not changed that much, but we are starting to work on some other things. But right now, what we do is we do a big random search across all of the algorithms in H2O, and then we do uh, stacked ensembles. And before I go into details, like all of this stuff can be configured from the AutoML function. You can turn off stacking, you can turn off certain subsets of algorithms, et cetera. But this is sort of the default algorithm. We do random search across, you know, GBMs, deep neural networks, GLMs, um, XGBoost. So we have an H2O GBM and we also have the XGBoost, actual XGBoost code is bundled into H2O as well. Um, and then the reason these two things work well together is because when we have sort of a random assortment of models that creates some diversity um, in the group and stacked ensembles work very well if there is a diverse set of models to begin with. And that's because, you know, um, basically the models make uncorrelated errors. So when one of them is failing, you know, maybe the other one is not. So they kind of make up for each other. And so these, this combination works really well together. And I'll, at the end, point you to some benchmarks where you can see how we benchmarked it against some of the other systems like AutoSKLearn and Teapot, um, which take totally different approaches. And this does stack up, um, just made a joke, but <laughs> um, this method, even though it's quite simple, um, actually performs quite well uh, compared to some of the more complex methods out there. So this is just kind of a reiteration of what I've said so far. Um, so, you know, we do this big search, we do two stacked ensembles. Um, we've kind of, we've got a stacked ensemble with all the models, which can, you know, depending on how long you run it, could be quite large. So then we also have a more lightweight ensemble where we take the best from each uh, algorithm family, and that's more of like a model that you might want to put into production. And then what you get back is what we call a leaderboard. So that's just, you know, you, if you're familiar with Kaggle, you have a leaderboard, everybody's ranked on there by their scores. Um, and that's how you, you, you see all the models that were trained. And then, you know, you could choose the one at the top, or you could based on other things like, like prediction speed or training time or complexity of some way, um, you could choose a different one, but we'll just rank by pure performance uh, by default. And this is kind of what the API looks like. Uh, so this is what it would look like in Python. So you basically just start up the H2O cluster, load, load some data in, um, and this data never goes into Python memory. It's just all in the, the Java process that we call the H2O cluster. And then you can specify, basically, this is the minimum set of things that you need to specify. One, how long is this thing going to run for, um, either by the, the time or the number of models. Um, and then what's the data, and then what is the thing you're trying to predict. Uh, we have defaults in terms of what metrics we'll sort by if you, know, if you don't specify it otherwise. And then this is what it would look like in R. So we have just a single function in R. Um, and then we get the leaderboard back. Just going to show you a. It's probably quite hard to see this, but uh, this is what it looks like in the GUI. We have a GUI in H2O as well that you can use if you don't want to write any code. Everything can be done from clicking. Um, so some people use that. This is kind of like what a basic leaderboard looks like. This is essentially a data frame that has the name of the model and the scores. And then we have something that's also called an extended leaderboard where we put other metrics that you might use to choose a model. Like one of the things that we 
um, see a lot, or we've had a lot of customers ask us is like, I want like the best model that's kind of like the fastest in production. Maybe that's not the stacked ensemble, maybe that's not even one of the top three, but we, we're gonna sort of use the prediction speed as, as a way to pick as well. So you can generate training time and prediction speed, and we're working on adding a whole bunch of other different metrics that you could include in the leaderboard and sort by and kind of make a better decision about your model. Um, I'm gonna skip this section so that we have enough time for the, I'm, I'm gonna have like a couple more slides and then I'll leave time for questions. Um, this is just a high level roadmap of stuff we're looking at. Um, that first bullet is, is gonna be in the next release. We're also getting into interpretability methods. So in the next release of H2O, we're gonna have a whole new section of interpretability methods. So a lot of these methods are already available in H2O, but we're, what we're doing is, is making a better interface for them and kind of grouping them all together. And then once you have like an AutoML leaderboard with a bunch of models, we're also doing a lot of different plots that kind of show um, the different interpretability um, like plots, I guess, um, with a bunch of models overlaid on the same plot. So you can have some idea about how they compare. Um, we're also looking at uh, algorithmic fairness methods. That's not gonna be in the next release, but um, this is a little bit more about the interpretability or explainability um, stuff that we're offering, um, work in progress stuff. And um, I'm gonna skip this and I'm gonna just spend the last two minutes on some benchmarks. So. You know, one of the things, like there's a whole lot of AutoML tools out there now. I mean, there's not a whole lot, but there's starting to be more and more. And, you know, how do you know what's a good tool to use? I mean, they're all good in their own ways. Um, but especially as like more large companies get involved in this, we're going to see a lot of like what we call benchmarking. So, uh, so, you know, some company comes out with a plot and they say they're thing is way better than everybody else's thing. You know, I'm sure you've all seen it. So over the past few years, I've been working with a team of like um, AutoML researchers, essentially, um, not just at H2O, but broadly, um, uh, mostly people affiliated with the OpenML Foundation, and uh, which is in Europe. And we've uh, have a paper at ICML AutoML workshop last year, um, where we created this whole system to, to, to basically benchmark AutoML systems so that we could all, you know, just agree uh, that on, on something that's fair and that we can all continually uh, add new systems to this benchmark. And so if you have an AutoML system um, and it's not already in our benchmark, you can make a pull request and we can then benchmark it against a bunch of data sets in a, um, peer-reviewed way, basically, that uh, is sort of accepted by the community. So um, I think that's very important as we see a lot of stuff coming up. Uh, if you want someone to read this paper to you, we have a YouTube video by uh, Rachel, who used to be at Kaggle, who went over this. And then this year at ICML AutoML Workshop, uh, I had a paper just on h 2 AutoML. And so that's uh, you know, taking me three years to get around to writing the paper, um, but now there's a paper out there and there's, there's a lot about the scalability of H2O and I do a big study about, you know, taking, um, watching how performance shifts over time from like 10,000 row training set all the way up to 100 million rows just on a single machine. So you can see, um, and yeah, I think I'll just leave you with this slide where we do some Q&A. Um, and I think I'm trying to look in the Zoom chat. I'm not sure if that's where the questions are. Maybe Christina has them lined up. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that was really, really amazing, Erin. And um, if you open up the Q&A tab at the bottom, uh, if you can see on your Zoom window. Oops. If not, I'm I'm able to kind of relay the okay. questions. Okay, that's different from the chat window, I guess. Here we go. Yeah, got it. Um, 
Now let me just put my screen back. Oopsies. All right, so we've got uh, what was the link to the paper? That's easy. We can go back right there. Um, what is the advantage of using target encoding as opposed to other types of encoding for categorical variables? Um, target encoding just works very well when you have high cardinality um, categoricals. So it might not always be the best type of encoding. Maybe label encoding is fine, or maybe no encoding is fine, or maybe just, um, you know, even, well, in the case of like, let's say 40,000 levels, you know, one hot encoding is never going to be the right thing. But um, one of the things that we're trying to sort out right now is, you know, how do we decide what the right encoding is, you know, in sort of an automated way. And so, um, and then like what, you can kind of just spend a lot of time like experimenting <clears throat> with this stuff. So I think one of the hard parts about all AutoML systems that um, designers have to think about is like we can do all sorts of things, but like how do we do the best things in the time that we're given? Um, that's the hard part is uh, if we're only given an hour to come up with the best result, like how much time do we spend on figuring out encodings versus random search and how much time do we allocate to the GBMs versus the deep neural networks, et cetera. So that's all like, essentially when I say like our algorithm is, you know, simple in the sense that there's just random search and stacking, the hard parts are the allocation of everything and deciding how much time everything gets in an optimal way, uh, given a time constraint. Um, how does H2 AutoML compare with data robot and Google's offerings? Um, I mean, one of the main differences is that it's open source. Um, H2O AutoML is part of the H2O package, which is open source. Um, there's, uh, so yeah, so I would say that's the main thing. Um, I'm not going to say much about Data Robot. Google AutoML, um, they started off mostly focused on, well, they're still quite focused on deep, deep learning. Um, so they first started off with just like image classification and then just some text stuff. There's now Google AutoML tables, uh, which is for tabular data, which I probably didn't mention and glossed over, but that's what H2O is all about, tabular data. It's not really an image classification system. It's not really that geared towards text. Uh, we're gonna get more text support, but you know, it's, it's just not. So um, yeah, that's, uh, Google AutoML, we did not have that in the benchmark because it's not an open source system. So there are other papers that have looked at both Google AutoML and other systems and H2O that you can look up. Um, let's see. Do leaderboards. Okay, I'm not sure if I understand that question. Um, here's one that I would get a lot. How does this product compare to driverless AI? So this is asked by somebody who probably knows a little bit about H2O as a company. So we also have another tool that's called driverless AI, which is not open source. And so essentially we have two AutoML tools at H2O, the one that I'm talking about today and driverless AI. And one, I mean, there's a lot of differences. Um, Couple of, couple of the major differences are driverless AI is uh, really exploiting GPUs a whole lot more than H2O. So H2O was built starting in 2012 where we weren't seeing a lot of GPU computing and machine learning yet. It was very much CPU based. So all the H2O algorithms are CPU based with the exception of XGBoost, which we bundle into H2O, which can be used with GPUs. Um, and we do a lot of XGBoost inside the H2O AutoML algorithm. So there's some GPU acceleration, but you know, primarily it's CPU. Uh, so that's one of, the, one of the differences. The other big difference from like a data science perspective is um, there's a huge focus on automated feature engineering in driverless AI. And one of H2O's strategies is we hired a whole bunch of Kaggle grandmasters to sort that all out and basically design, you know, I mean, that's kind of how you win Kaggle is you spend a lot of time on feature engineering and then a lot of time on like stacking and things like that. So they are sort of experts on that. And that's one of the sort of, you know, reasons why you would actually pay money 
for a tool, you know, as opposed to an open source one. And there's a whole bunch of other things that make a little bit um, easier in enterprise, like uh, lots more model management stuff and driverless AI and more interpretability stuff. Currently, we even have algorithmic fairness stuff in there. Um, so there are some differences. It's a little bit more bare bones in the, in the open source, but um, but it is still a system that's fully designed to go to production and lots of our customers are huge banks, insurance companies and whatever, and are putting H2O into production. So um, I think I'm out of time, but um, yeah, I think maybe I should stop since I don't want to go over my limit, but um, thanks, Erin. I'll make a note of all the questions that have been asked. Um, and if it's okay, I might shoot you a DM on the Slack um, to see if